And now without further delay, let's begin today's event, sponsored by InterSystems and hosted by American Banker. I would like to introduce your moderator for today, and that is Mike Sisk. Mike, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Adam, and I would like to welcome the audience once again. We are very grateful that you have chosen to share some of your busy day with us. We know that your time is valuable, and we will honor that today with what I'm confident will be an engaging 60 minutes or so of discussion. Uh, once again, our topic today is drowning in data, thirsting for information. And uh, my name is Mike Sisk. I will be your moderator today. I'm a contributing editor at American Banker, and my articles have also appeared in Barron's, Cranes New York Business, Inc., Institutional Investor, Strategy and Business, and Worth. And uh, I am very, very pleased uh, to introduce our two uh, speakers today. Uh, Monica Somerville heads Sellens Capital Markets Practice and is based in the firm's London office. Monica is a seasoned financial services industry executive and recognized thought leader with more than 20 years experience in capital markets, both on the buy and sell side, as well as with service providers. Uh, she's been quoted by the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Financial News, Forbes, CNBC, as well as others. Uh, and with a deep understanding of market structure and technology underpinned by years of delivering cutting edge technology solutions for capital markets participants, uh, Monica has a proven track record assisting clients in leveraging the emerging technology and industry trends driving change. And we are very, very pleased to have Monica with us here today. Uh, and joining her is Joe Lichtenberg. Joe is Global Head of Product and Industry Marketing at InterSystems. Joe is responsible for product and industry marketing for data management software. He has decades of experience working with various data management, analytics, and cloud computing technology providers with deep experience in financial services. And uh, we are also very, very pleased to have Joe with us here today. And uh, just before we jump into things, I wanted to reiterate one quick thing that Adam mentioned, that is that is that we do have time for Q&A at the end. Usually we set aside 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, you can put your question in the queue throughout the hour. And uh, you know, please, as, this, as the uh, uh, question pops into your head, just get that into the queue. And if we don't get to a question you've asked in the time we have today, we will definitely follow up. So please, your voice will be heard. Uh, we very much want to hear from you. So ask away. And I think with that, I will officially turn things over to, to Joe to get, the, uh, to get the ball rolling here. Joe, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. And welcome, everyone. Yep. Thanks for joining. So I think um, to kick it off, uh, Monica, it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to a, a interesting, uh, informative conversation with you. Maybe to start, Monica, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about Selen and Selen's uh, uh, research uh, you know, relative to the kinds of things that we're talking about today. Sure. Thanks, Joe. And, and thanks, Mike, as well. And I probably should have uh, said in my bio that I've been quoted by, you know, the most prestigious of all American banker as, as well. Um, great to be here today. But just to give you a little bit background, um, the audience on, on Selen, we're a research and advisory company, and we're focused on the use of technology across financial services. So our mission, simply put, is to enable confident technology decisions. Our clients come from financial institutions across the globe, and we actually have clients in 73 countries, and that's across the financial services spectrum, including five of the top global insurers, global banks, and wealth managers, as well as clients from leading market infrastructures. And I can tell you that across all of our financial institution clients, which you know we're speaking to on a daily basis, the subject of how to leverage data is one that we are discussing all of the time. Financial services has always understood the importance of data, but in the past, it was really seen as more of a byproduct of the business, you know, exhaust, if you will, whereas today data is being seen as really critical to many of the new business models that are emerging. So in other words, it's, you know, it's the engine of growth for these firms. So that's a little high level on me. Um, Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit about InterSystems and what you do in this area as well? Thank you, Monica. I would love to. Great intro. Um, so again, my name is Joe Lichtenberg. I'm responsible for um, global uh, product and industry marketing with a heavy focus on financial services. Um, and if you're not familiar with our company, InterSystems, uh, I'll just give you a, a quick uh, two minute overview. So InterSystems is a data management technology company and our software is used at more than half of the top global banks 
uh, for a wide variety of initiatives, but typically to solve uh, what are enterprise-wide data management, integration, and analytics initiatives, uh, especially for firms that need to work with lots of different data that comes from different sources across the, the enterprise. So working with data that is uh, locked away in data silos. And we see a wide range of different types of initiatives, both uh, run the bank and, and change the bank types of initiatives with our customers. So we, you know, we typically get involved uh, with initiatives uh, like enterprise risk, uh, compliance, liquidity initiatives, business management reporting, and, and a whole range of internal, internally focused digital transformation initiatives as well as externally facing initiatives like, for example, uh, next generation wealth management applications. Uh, we have real time uh, multi-asset trading platforms uh, that we're powering and a wide range of AI and machine learning enabled processes and applications for things like hyper-personalization and cross-selling and so on. And you know what we see now quite often is that many of these initiatives require the implementation of a single, accurate, consistent view of enterprise data. Uh, Monica, very much you know, what you were alluding to and what Selen um, and many others are referring to as an enterprise data fabric in order to bring together this disparate data from across the, the enterprise on demand as it's needed without creating more data silos, right? So uh, accessing the data where it lives uh, to be able to bring it together for a wide variety of different uh, different types of initiatives. Um, so uh, I guess to start, uh, Monica, uh, you personally uh, and at Selen, you do a lot of research both into the, the business drivers and the tech across uh, financial services firms. In fact, you recently wrote a report uh, that's titled, uh, Financial Institutions Embrace New Smart Enterprise Data Fabric Approaches to Better Leverage Enterprise-Wide Data for Advanced Insight uh, and Capabilities, um, which is very much aligned with what we're talking about today. And by the way, that report is available on both the Selen website and on our InterSystems website. Uh, and that report really gets into these sort of current top issues and initiatives in really great detail. So maybe we can start, Monica, if you don't mind, talking a bit about um, what you're finding now as the top business drivers and associated data issues and tech issues that you're hearing from uh, your discussions and your research uh, with your clients and with financial services firms. Sure. And, you know, there's certainly, there's a lot to discuss in this topic. So I think maybe just to start um, from a higher point of view. So the first point to think about is that we're all having to make this shift to data driven living. And it's not unique to financial services. It's not even unique to our professional lives. You know, new global data is being created at an astonishing rate. Um, data and analytics boosted by AI is really changing the way we live, and it's changing the way we save, invest, and spend. And that's the same for you know us in our personal lives and also from a company point of view. So we're now measuring data in zettabytes, and zettabytes are equivalent to one trillion gigabytes, and I'm old enough to remember when a megabyte was was a big deal. So that's, that's really- I had, the, you know. I had the floppy drives and I had the 20 meg <laughs> hard drive on the Mac Plus, where it's writing database applications. Yeah, I remember when it was five inch, you know, the five and a half inch or five, yeah, five and a quarter inch drives. Um, they were really floppy. But yeah, things are changing really rapidly and financial service institutions are having to look, you know, much further ahead when they're creating strategies that um, involve leveraging data. It's not just the quantity of data, that is changing and growing, but it's the type of data and the awareness of the value of data by individuals, by businesses, 
and by governments, you know, and in some cases, the tools, platforms, and strategies for managing the data that have been relied on for years, and you know, this is certainly a topic we've been following for a while, they're just simply not fit for purpose anymore. Um, so it, it's here, I think, that the financial services um, industry is really doubly exposed. So as I said earlier, the industry's always understood that data is important. But this has meant that banks in particular have already invested massively in technology around data management. So hundreds of millions on a per firm basis easily. And these past investments are now really holding back the business. But meanwhile, we're seeing entrants, new entrants in the market, and they can build on the latest data platforms, which gives them an immediate advantage. So for our discussions today, um, just to sort of set the scene here, I thought it'd be good to look at some specific business use cases where data is playing a pivotal role. Um, we've talked about, I know, Joe, you mentioned some of these already. So these can include use cases on the run the bank side, as well as those on the change the bank side of the house. And I know you're involved in both of these type of areas. Right. Um, some examples on the run the bank side are critical functions. And these include things like risk, data privacy, management reporting, treasury, and those are areas where, um, you know, we found that data insight can really help increase efficiency. Ultimately, that reduces costs. And then on the change the bank side, you know, we're going to highlight a few use cases where better data insights can become game changers in boosting revenue, improving customer experience, or even giving rise to new business models altogether. And then just to wrap things up, we'll give some thoughts um, on how we want to meet these challenges with better data management and offer some thoughts on next steps that financial institutions can take. And hopefully, um, you know, as we said earlier, we'll have time for questions. So please, if we don't get to it, we will want to, to get to all your questions. So um, just keep those coming in. Sounds great. Um, so, you know, obviously oh, we sorry. see... I did want to say... <laughs> I forgot. I did want to say um, in defense of banks, because I feel like we're being a little hard on banks, but I did just want to make the point that um, this is no easy task, especially for larger banks that have multiple divisions spread over multiple locations. So this is just some of our research. You know, we track how different firms approach things like data management, and we have found that data functions in these large organizations are spread out over many different teams. They don't necessarily sit in the same organization. So there's inevitably a need to sort of in interlink data that's distributed over all these different groups. And, you know, from a technology point of view, that's that's really no simple task. So just wanted to make that point that it's, it's not, there is no easy solution. There's an explosion, right? I mean, data is exploding. Right. The business drivers are uh, throughout the organization for defensive, uh, run the bank and innovative, offensive, externally facing, change the bank, more data locked away and more silos uh, than ever before. And so, you know, as you say, data management now is a, uh, you know, is absolutely uh, top of the priority to 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 figure these things out and get access to the data that you need. Uh, and the uh, externally, the market is moving faster than ever before. So it's sort of this confluence of events. So sort of like a perfect storm right now that organizations need to deal with. Absolutely. Did you so, want to dive uh, into some of the use cases? Yeah, so maybe we start with, um, you had a slide up with uh, Run the Bank and Change the Bank initiatives. Uh, maybe we start uh, with uh, more internal Run the Bank and Enterprise Risk initiatives and, and uh, start there, uh, and then uh, move on to some of the, the externally facing initiatives later in the, in the chat. Sounds good. Okay, well, let's, uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about risk. So this is definitely another area that banks have spent, you know, millions, hundreds of millions. It's just the numbers are phenomenal um, in many cases. And you can see from the recent headlines, however, when it comes to risk management, that's an area that's still proving a challenge for lots of banks. Um, as the listeners to this session are, are surely aware, I'm sure American banker um, readers know that there's lots of reasons why risk is becoming more important, but you know, there's been an increased regulatory focus on better risk management overall, and that stems back to the financial crisis. So this is going back 
over a decade. Um, it's a big topic, but there are all sorts of risks across the bank. So it's worth noting, you know, you've got things like market and credit risk, security risk, and with security risk, um, it's folded in issues around privacy, which is another area that we can talk about separately in a bit. We've got operational risk, reputational, liquidity, systematic, compliance risk. You know, all of these things um, are really unified by data, right? Data is going to lie at the heart of, of many of these issues and, and trying to figure out how to assess that risk is always going to involve pulling together data that is invariably spread and distributed over many systems and many locations. So banks need a way to get the right data to the right hands. And that data has to be trustworthy. That's another big issue. Um, and that's harder to do than it sounds. So you really right. need to be, have advanced approaches here to linking data. Um, and then in terms of compliance, you know, stress testing has become more and more used by regulators and the cost of failing stress tests are just huge. In the U.S., um, for example, banks that fail certain stress tests uh, will not be allowed to issue dividends, for example. So these are very real business impacts. So, you know, it, it's... Uh... I, we see it as well. I mean, it's more challenging than ever right, because of the number one, the data explosion. Number two, you know, the the uh, level of responsibility, uh, you know, not just at the corporate level, but with uh, you know, CFO attestation and uh, and pr it, what we see is not just pro providing you know access to, as you say, the current trusted data. Uh, but, you know, you talk about stress testing, but also the, you know, we see the business managers need to really be able to drill into the data and the regulators as well. So when regulators come in, you know, we don't necessarily know what are the ad hoc questions that they're going to ask. So being able to get access to the data and understand the, the lineage and what's been done to the data and what source system data come from and is it accurate, is it consistent? And then be able to, you know, get answers to unplanned questions and combine it in different ways. Uh, you know, all of those things just sort of compound the, the data management challenge. One of the things that and, I wanted to show. But go, go ahead, Mike. Oh, sorry. And I was just going to pick up on something you said about ad hoc requests. And it's just um, just that something we're hearing from the financial institutions about how that has really ramped up from regulators. And it used to be where they could get back. It's not just the, the request are ad hoc, but the time frame to respond is, right. is much tighter. So it used to be, you know, they might have weeks, but now it's days. You know, sometimes they have to get back almost the same day. So regulators are not you know, they're not taking that excuse that, oh, well, we need to pull all this data together. They really are expected to have those answers to hand. And if they can't, right, what are the, the kinds of penalties that we're seeing firms, uh, you know, getting hit with if they can't answer those questions accurately and in a timely manner, right? And it all comes down to, you know, accurate sort of control and access uh, to enterprise data and being able to combine it. So the, I mean, these are really hard problems. One of the thing, one of the things that I wanted to share, see if I can push this slide live. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, so we uh, at InterSystems recently sponsored some uh, some primary research where we interviewed more than a hundred C level execs across different financial services firms, um, and there's you know there's a, a lot of really interesting responses from firms, but. Uh, relevant to what we were just talking about. One of the questions that we asked is what percentage of your data practices total operating budget is dedicated to compliance initiatives, right? And so it's a little confusing to look at this slide, but uh, what it says is 90% of the firms are spending at least 40% of their total data budget on a variety of different compliance initiatives, right? So it's taking up, uh, you know, almost half of their total uh, data budget uh, across 90% of these firms, which is massive. Uh, because number one, these are hard problems. But then the other data point um, that was really interesting is even though they're spending that much on compliance initiatives, 95% of firms are still saying that 
40 percent, at least 40 percent of their efforts are still handled manually. Right. And so, you know, there's still a lot that's not automated. It's not streamlined. Manual processes, you know, create latencies and delays and, you know, potentially uh, errors and inconsistencies. Uh, so, you know, clearly it's a it's a really hard problem. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, in large part, Monica, because of the things that you were talking about in terms of massive data silos and, you know, sort of complexities in terms of um, how you need to access and work with the data. So it's a, it continues to be an, an ongoing process. And then just one more slide that I wanted to share here. So we also asked which were the, the primary uh, uh, areas of concern uh, when it came to uh, regulatory compliance, and also which are the most resource intensive. So in the teal color, the primary areas of concern, things like risk data aggregation, right, and which is a hard problem. I mean, it's, it's about accessing uh, the appropriate data on demand from the existing silos uh, and running, you know, in many cases, complex and sophisticated uh, risk calculations on it, CFO attestation, and then closely related to CFO attestation is CCAR. And then if you look at uh, the areas of the highest resource consumption, right? So, uh, you know, what are the things that are taxing tech and data management infrastructures and, and uh, what, what the organization the most? Um, not really surprised that initiatives around KYC and Sarbanes-Oxley uh, top the list, but there, there's a lot here, right? I mean, there's a lot of uh, initiatives in terms of areas of concern uh, and resource consumption. And I think it's interesting out of this because this is another conversation I've had recently, and it was it was people on the asset management side in sort of operational roles, but it was a compliance discussion, and they did point out that there will always be a need for you know manual intervention of sorts but what they're looking to do by getting better at their data handling and data management and data analytics is make sure that the manual intervention is the value added activity so they their team are getting very good at really understanding where they can add value to the clients about certain types of activities and functions and they want the data analytics to handle sort of the grunt work in terms of flagging problems flagging you know even the predictive end of saying, this looks like it's going to be a problem and we need to reach out to the client and start speaking to them. And there, of course, so, you know, there was a question um, going around saying, well, we're ever going to have 0% manual intervention and we don't want to get to 0%, but we want the manual right. intervention to be value added. And the way it's value added is you get better at producing data analytics and especially predictive analytics that, um, totally. you know, that, going to use the expertise of your staff. 100%. We see that also, and hopefully uh, we'll have time later in the talk to talk more about uh, applications of machine learning and AI. So we're seeing a lot of that now where uh, machine learning enabled exception handling uh, is being implemented to do exactly the kinds of things that you're talking about. So you're never going to get to zero, and that's not the intent because there's always things that need to get bubbled up to folks, uh, but you want to be smart about uh, you know, what are the exceptions uh, that really need to get um, surfaced to the appropriate people in the organizations and what are the things that don't and to help streamline those processes even more. So we see that as well. Mm, good. And the other thing I was going to pick up on what you said, and it's, it's sort of a good segue, um, you know, you need to combine all this data to, to, to come up with a risk view across the enterprise. And in some cases, it's very difficult to combine data because there's issues around privacy, right, that comes into play, especially when you're looking at client data. Um, so I just thought we could maybe talk a little bit about that and just, uh, yep, there we go. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Privacy, privacy is a huge issue, right, especially with the, the uh, amount of data and the different applications of the data, downstream applications of the data and who's going to access it down to the granular, you know, field level. So, you know, it'd be great to, to hear what uh, you're seeing in, in terms of privacy uh, from your firms. 
basically there's just a really big tension that's what we're seeing whereas on the business side they want to use the data without um having to worry too much about who owns it and, and all that. They just want to really make use of it. You know, they don't want to, obviously they want to be mindful and respectful of the data, but um, it's very difficult to make use of data now. And in some cases, a knee jerk reaction of the company is just to segment, segment certain data sets and say hands off because we're not really sure that we can control, um, you know, put controls around it properly. So you have the compliance team, the chief data office, sort of at odds with the business users because they're right. going to be the more conservative side and say, well, we need to err on the side of just making sure that we're protecting our customer data. We don't want to get the firm in trouble. Um, but really, like you, what you said, the, the solution there is to strengthen your access controls, encryption techniques. You know, you can you can achieve all of these things. So the, so the technology does exist and you can get to very granular levels of control if you've got the right um, technology in place. But as you can see from this slide, again, in defense of the banks, this is a very complex problem. As you go from country to country, there's a real complex patchwork of different data privacy regulations. Um, there's a lot of focus on transparency and oversight and the control framework. So that's being looked at much more closely. So if you want to have these highly granular entitlement controls, you know, you need to have that in place in order to ensure that the data is being used responsibly. And we just keep coming back to this question of it's not just the data you have, but it's the, it's the data management platform that you have in order to allow you to leverage it. It's hard, right? I mean, you, you know, the word that you used was um, tension. Right. It, I mean, and it's not I mean, clearly it's a data data management problem, but it's it's a lot more than that. Right. I mean, you have the CDO office, you have the compliance teams that just by definition, they're going to be more conservative and more defensive. Um, and then you have the business uh, and the um, you know, the application teams and the digital transformation teams uh, that are looking at it from, uh, you know, the latent value stored away in the data in terms of being able to bring value to the business. And obviously, they want to be more aggressive. So, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> another hard problem from a technology standpoint around uh, being able to control who has access to which data. Uh, and again, uh, you know, it's as the data goes on its journey from the source systems to, you know, the various uh, steps. Uh, along uh, data transformation and uh, getting access to the data and using it in different downstream applications. You know, what are the data elements that need to be masked? Who has the, the uh, privileges, the access privileges to access which data, uh, as well as, you know, it's not just the data and the technology problem, it's an organizational problem. So organizationally, you know, how do you put in place the framework uh, so that the the CDO office uh, is not completely stressed out and the business is able to get the value out of the data that they need. Uh, you know, it is this tension that, that you talk about. And this is an area that the incumbent players, they, they actually have an advantage over the new entrants because they have data on customers going back years and years. And their customers quite often have used them through various life events, you know, for, for different types of activities. So if they can use this data and in a way that the client's happy with, you know, people today are used to hyper personalized experiences. And if you can deliver an experience that is truly tailored for your client that makes your client's life better, you know, they're going to welcome that. So I know privacy gets a bad rap. It's probably misused in many cases. You know, the data isn't used properly, but we're, we're not talking about just generic advertising. We're talking about examples of banks creating very personalized, tailored solutions that are well received by their clients and this right. opens up revenue streams for them it you know it basically builds that trust with the client it enhances that relationship you know if you're dealing with a provider who can do more for you and really understands you 
you know, they get you, um, you're going to want to give that, that that company more business. And like I said, the incumbents have an advantage here because they're starting off with deeper relationships that's built on years of data. It's just tapping into that data is the hard part. That's a great thread. Uh, yeah, on so many levels. So I, I definitely want to talk about uh, sort of these innovative change the bank types of initiatives that we're seeing and that you're seeing um, and incorporating machine learning and AI into those kinds of initiatives. And, you know, there is this this interesting dichotomy between the startups, right, that don't have the, you know, the legacy, uh, which can be a, a help or a hindrance, right? Right. Uh, you know, from the standpoint of I have all this legacy technology, you know, it can slow me down, but I also have access to all of this really valuable historical data that the startups and the fintechs don't have. Uh, but before we shift there, I did want to talk about, uh, you know, another sort of um, run the bank or, or in, in, uh, internally facing initiative around enterprise liquidity and treasury and cash, because that's sort of fits into this uh, you know, discussion around run the bank initiatives. How can, how can we run them more efficiently? Um, and especially now with um, the, the volatility that is you know, happening on a, on a, not only on a, on a daily basis, but a, you know, intraday and sometimes intra-minute basis and the impact on liquidity and treasury. Maybe we can have that conversation and then, uh, and then shift to um, some of the more <laughs> Uh, externally facing uh, change, change the bank uh, initiatives. Sure, sure. And I mean, Treasury is probably another is another area that will do both. You know, you, you have to run the bank. You absolutely have to run the bank and, and have proper Treasury. But there's probably opportunities to, to change the bank, too. But starting with the with the run the bank side again, post the financial crash, the regulations have really um, forced banks to, to keep more capital on hand and that gets very expensive because that capital that you have to hold on, it's not really working for you. It's not, it's, it's not doing much. So you're, um, it's a situation where even small improvements in efficiency. So as, as you can get better and better at making sure you only have as much capital as you need to, um, you know, to satisfy your payments, satisfy um, things that are coming in, that can lead to to massive savings or can lead to a lot of, um, you know, just additional incremental revenues from that capital that you're freeing up to, to put to work for you. And then at the same time, we're seeing lots of changes in the global payment system. So different countries have different systems, but in general, the move is more towards intraday and even real time in a number of jurisdictions. So there's a real opportunity to manage your, your actual cash um, reserves much more efficiently. So you, you have a certain amount of float that you're, you're moving around the world and even just predicting in terms of certain payment systems, you know, understanding which systems operate in batch and which ones are more real time and where you need money at a particular time, where you're going to need to fund overnight. All of these things are part of the treasury function. So treasury is a big function. You know, there's an internal treasury function, there's an external, there's lots of different pieces to treasury. Um, but the big themes really are managing that float, managing um, your reserves and moving into more of a real time environment. And how do you do that? You have to have that picture. Yeah, so what, what's the right level, right? I mean, if you don't have enough and you know, you, you're clearly at risk, especially with you know, the intraday volatility that's happening. And if you have too much, you're missing out on opportunities, right? What's the opportunity cost of keeping, uh, being, being too liquid? Uh, and then uh, you know, the larger the organization, the more complex it is because you have different parts of the business and, geographically, and then you add in the real-time components. So you want, uh, you know, real-time data feeds. So if you're using Kafka or however you're uh, tapping into the, the real-time transactions and uh, the front office data, uh, again, again, kind of a perfect storm that uh, is, has always been difficult, but now it's sort of harder, harder than ever. And then the other thing that um, you, you sort of touched on is it's not, as if that were not hard enough, or, you know, a real time view uh, of uh, the position uh, enterprise wide. 
But then how do you build in predictions, right? What are the scenario planning uh, work that firms want to do? What's likely to occur? So it's not just sort of the state of the state, you know, at this moment. Uh, but, you know, if you think about like Black-Scholes and probability and, you know, that uh, you're pricing into options, similarly for scenario planning, what's likely to happen? So if I have uh, derivatives and positions in GameStop um, and it's been more volatile, than ever, right? So, you know, are you seeing firms starting to incorporate that level of analytics and uh, predictive analytics and machine learning models and things like that? Uh, treasury, it, it is tough because typically there are lots of different treasury systems and in certain banks for regulatory reasons, they have, they actually have, um, the segment operations of the bank, maybe they have to keep the retail operations separate from investment banking, like here in the UK, that happens. Um, so right now, a lot of the treasury systems, obviously, there's different vendor solutions in the space. So I think up to now, a lot of people have been looking to maybe work with the vendor solutions and say, how can we join those up? Um, it's I haven't seen anyone who has, a you know, can can brag that they've really cracked this nut. It's it's very um, complicated. I think there is a lot of attention being paid to it, and obviously you know, there's different approaches. One is to see where you can pull data out of your systems and pull it together. Um, another one is just to see where you can link the different systems together. But it's it, there is no there's no sort of perfect answer right now. It's it's quite. Uh, you know, that traditional mix of lots of different systems and lots of different approaches across the industry. One of the things that uh, hopefully we'll have time to talk about uh, uh, later in the chat is some of these data management approaches, including an enterprise data fabric. And um, the ability to incorporate uh, all types of analytics into that fabric. So we're starting to have conversations uh, with uh, risk and uh, heads of uh, treasury and some of these financial services organizations that are starting to look at exactly that in this in this dynamic data fabric. So a little bit of a uh, hopefully a foreshadowing of what we can talk about in 10 or 15 minutes or so. Uh, but it is a, a sort of a very exciting uh, forward looking uh, approach to, to liquidity. Um, yeah, and, then, and that's sure. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Mark. I was going to say, no, that just ties into the, the paper, um, the research work that you mentioned at the, at the start of the session is that, you know, the firms, they have this, these sort of legacy systems, they can't necessarily afford or they don't want to rip those systems out. They've tried That's different right. approaches. You know, they've tried the single source of truth and realized there is no single source of truth. So the data fabric, this is why, you know, the research that I looked at, a number of the biggest banks, um, are are moving to this approach because it is something that does let you work with your existing environment reuse some of the investment you've made you know keeps keeps that investment intact but then gives you that additional flexibility that you need as you're you're sort of alluding to but yeah i won't <laughs> i won't jump totally. there just yet totally um, so you know we spent a fair amount of time talking about uh, run the bank initiatives maybe we should uh, pivot at this point to some of the change the bank uh, offensive types of initiatives that we're seeing, and there's a lot, um, and uh, sort of a lot of excitement, innovation, and, and you know, really interesting things that are being done. Um, so, you know, maybe Monica, if I could, you know, turn it over to you to start with the kinds of things that that you're seeing, and uh, then I'll, I'll try to uh, chime in with some of the things that we're seeing from our customers as well. Sure. Well, you know, I've already talked a little bit about uh, hyper-personalization, but I, this ties into the whole customer experience. So, you know, as as banks are looking to sort of go away from this product-centric view to a client-centric view, they need to understand, you know, that, that instantly means you need to understand um, your client and, and really pull together all the services that you provide across the entity. And whereas in the past and, and still organizationally, you're probably are, are designed to have different departments by product. When you look to the customer, when the customer looks to you, you should see them, you know, in, in a complete picture. So 
building that sort of 360 degree view of your client, you know, and in order to give them a really good customer experience, um, that's an area where we're seeing lots of uh, data management and data analytics come into play. Um, you know, a lot of the, the fintechs in this area are very good at this already. So right. we've already mentioned some of the companies out there. Um, and even things like the, the whole gamifying the experience, improving the engagement experience, you know, that's all Robin that all customer. Yep. Yeah. Robin Hood. Right. <laughs> Robin Hood that's a perfect storm, right? I mean, everybody's getting twelve hundred dollar checks and Robin Hood, you know, makes investing one seem easy in a in a bull market and fun. I, I will I will tell you that I have not uh, moved any money to Robinhood. I'm, I'm old and I'm I'm afraid because I do know how these things always end. It's not not a matter of if it's a, it's a matter of when. But I tell you, they've really tapped into uh, you know making it exciting and, and gamifying it. Uh, and I mean that's that's the uh, you know sort of the the mo of these fintechs that are successful. Right. I mean, they they take a new approach to, you know, existing sort of applications and services like Lemonade or things like that. And they, you know, make it a streamlined, enjoyable experience. And, you know, they're using the latest techniques and customer experience and customer 360 and gamification um, and just making it totally, you know, cool and, and disrupting the space. Uh, you know, so there's that trend. And then for the established um, financial services organizations, right? I mean, they have to find ways to compete, right? And they're not standing still. Uh, you know, they might have a little bit more or a lot more overhead in terms of their legacy uh, applications and organiz organizational structure and so forth. But they do have something that the, the startups don't have, right? I mean, they have reams and reams of this historical data. So as you say, if it's about you know, 360 degree view of your customers, uh, you know, and that's internal, you know, historical data as well as uh, enriching that with data from external sources. But that, you know, proprietary set of historical data that goes back five, seven, 10, 15 years, right? I mean, that's a huge asset that the startup fintechs, um, you know, they, they just don't have. So it's, a, you know, there's, uh, there's there's positives and negatives, you know, it's sort of associated on both sides. But certain certainly the you know all of the large established financial services organizations are not standing still, and they're you know innovating, uh, you know, both in terms of uh, you know new innovative services, uh, you know, to uh, you know take advantage of what they have, but also you know new advances in data management, and analytics, and machine learning, and and, and so forth. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic, and it's it's a chance. This is still a chance for you know incumbents. They need to find ways to play to their strength. So sometimes, looking at the customer, it challenges your thinking. So we've got ideas. People who've been in the industry for a long time have ideas about why people invest. Right? They invest for certain goals and they invest to make certain returns. You know, and there's this idea that oh, but today a lot of investors are backing causes they believe in, right? So ESG, huge trend in the marketplace. People are putting, some people are just interested in backing companies that they either identify with or they think are doing the right thing. Um, and how can you tap into this trend? Well, again, I think the incumbents, this is, this is playing to your strength. If you have the data, you know right. where the clients are. You, right. The incumbents have product experience. You know, they can build these Absolutely. very complex funds that really can target certain audiences. Very, you know, and if they have the right technology infrastructure, they'll have the agility to bring those products out quickly. So you're right. You know, it's not just being a fintech that started recently and has the latest, um, you know, cloud-based technology. It's also having. Right that experience to, to build these products and with the right technology, you have the agility and the data to, to bring those out to market quicker it, and it's really fulfill that need. Sorry. Yeah, and it, you know, it's a great time. So, you know, we have a lot of conversations with, uh, uh, you know, uh, technology uh, heads of uh, different parts of the organization and enterprise architects and so forth. And so, you know, the, the, uh, the production legacy 
uh, applications that they're running. That, by the way, are it's not a bad thing, right? I mean, they're providing a tremendous amount of value, and they continue to work, and they're bulletproof, and market spikes, and they, you know, they they don't, you know, have the many of them don't have the problems that some of the fintechs are having. So, you know, in no way, you know, is that a, a negative connotation around these legacy applications that they've been running, they've been running the bank for a really long time. But, you know, the point that I wanted to make is now, with the ability to not have to completely replatform. So, you know, sort of a combination of microservices architectures, which is very much for those of us that were still you know, doing this back in the late 90s and the early 2000s, with the advent of web services and service-oriented architectures and building reusable, reusable sets of um, uh, services that you can then orchestrate and, and being sort of strategic about what are the reusable services and what are the applications that are going to provide value. Architecturally, it's very similar to what's going on now with building sets of microservices and full lifecycle API management and being able to tap into the data and the application functionality across the organization and being able to innovate, you know, on top of that to use those as building blocks. Uh, and, and you know, that tends to be the sort of the key um, architectural pattern around when people talk about digital transformation, but it's also about, uh, you know, innovation and being able to create these new services, um, you know, with flexibility, with speed to market um, by leveraging, you know, and, and you know, uh, APIs and being able to orchestrate um, APIs um, and so forth. And then the, the other thing that, that I think is really relevant right now is we're seeing a lot uh, with uh, not just building uh, predictive models and, and machine learning models, but being able to take those models, you know, what uh, some people call operationalizing those models, but taking uh, advanced analytics uh, algorithms and machine learning models and embedding them directly into these event-driven processes and these transaction-driven uh, processes to execute in real time, right? So the canonical example of that is fraud detection, right? If you're a bank and you have a you know, massive amount of credit card transactions coming in from the point of sale systems, you can't have a human in the loop, right? You have to be able to execute these models to determine you know, uh, the, the probability of fraud um, and then if it seems okay, you know, straight through processing. If not, take the appropriate sort of deviations in the process flow. But we see that, you know, uh, that operational uh, operationalization of models, we see it in many different places, you know, in terms of um, customer experience and next best action and programmatic cross-selling and upselling for greater share of wallet. Um, so that's really the, the, the trend right now. And when you talk about not just enterprise data fabrics, but smart enterprise data fabrics, which you talked about in your paper. Um, it's really exactly that. It's being able to build these analytics capabilities into this dynamic data layer so that those types of things can execute uh, on demand. I think another <laughs> example that <laughs> it's a lot there. I feel, it's a lot I feel unpack, like I might but... have. I think I might have overwhelmed you with that. With that uh, <laughs> no, I know we. Uh, we. I think my role in this is to try to bring it back to the business focus. So that's that's what I'm going to try to do here. With um, right. but you know, we were absolutely. You know, there's there's lots of. There's, there's lots of new options for technology. And I think one of the takeaways for anyone listening to this, especially if they aren't on the technology side, is that all these things we're talking about, that they are achievable. You know, the technology's out there and it's been tried and tested. It's enterprise ready. So that's, and a lot of the functions that you think might be, um, you know, even stuff that you think is more the run the bank side or is more productive. I mean, one of the, one of the slides I have here, I'll just push it out now is about, um, you know, AML, anti-money laundering. And there's lots of ways this slide is just talking about how better data and advanced analytics can really improve your AML performance. But even there is something that, you know, if you get really good at this, that means your business is positioned to, to launch new types of products, go into new types of areas, maybe respond to regulation that much sooner. 
Um, we're seeing a lot of interest in the digital asset and cryptocurrency space, for example. And there are huge, right. huge concerns from the regulators around KYC and AML. Um, so something as simple as having invested in a data management platform that gives you superior AML capabilities actually puts your business in a position that you can react very quickly. And if you feel that your clients are wanting a new product um, that requires the regulators to be very, very comfortable about your AML capabilities, you, know, you have that capability. So, you know, we could have the best technology in the world, but if you don't have a business to apply it to, it's, it's what's the point? And a lot of these issues that seem really es esoteric or, or, you know, AML seems very geeky. Um, it's these are the things that are holding back the businesses, right, from launching products and moving into new markets. And that's the yeah. real, the real benefit of this technology. <laughs> Oh, it's always it's always driven by the the business need, right? You know, technology for technology's sake. That doesn't mean <laughs> anything, right? I mean, what's the business trying to do? Um, and so, you know, in large part, uh, uh, you know, what we see in terms of allowing the business heads, the folks on the side of the business, uh, to have the information that they need to make the right kinds of strategic decisions. And sometimes, you know, it's it's outside in. It's you know, it's competitively what's happening, um, but many times it's inside out. Also, it's like, what do we know about the business? What do we know about our customers? Right? What are they most likely to respond to? If we provide, you know, like Jeffrey Moore, the bowling pin strategy. What are you know? What are the adjacent services uh, that um, we can provide that are most likely to, to have a high degree of adoption that are going to help the bank? One of the things, I think we have about nine minutes left, and I do want to get to Q&A, but one of the things that I did want to talk about is uh, not so much, you know, data management technology, but uh, the, the, the latest modern approaches uh, that underlie all of these business initiatives that we're talking about um, and that you cover in the, in the paper, which um, go by different names, but... Uh, you know, the, the most common is around an enterprise data fabric or, you know, an analytics driven uh, data fabric. So maybe we can uh, take the next five minutes or so and, and I'd be happy to talk about um, what I'm seeing and I'm sure you're seeing um, similar things as well. Yeah, I'll just um, push this slide forward because this is just some, you know, some high level takeaways from, from mm -hmm. the research I did. And I'm quoting some Oliver Wyman research as well that we have. So, you know, we want to break down, financial institutions really want to break down the old silos they have, but also avoid new silos. So even, right. you know, even if companies are moving to the cloud, that's a, that's a danger. It should be flashing, danger, danger. There's, we might be creating so new was, silos here. Let's so not do that. That was a data lake, by the way. <laughs> Sorry? So it was a data lake, by the way, you know, it's yes. data lake, which was, you know, really, really hot five years ago, um, you know, very various levels of value that organizations have have gotten from them. Um, it just, you know, it, it essentially was a new data silo where there's a lot of, you know, inconsistent, not integrated data that didn't have a common semantic layer across it. So, you know, somewhat similar to, uh, you know, take, taking the data and, and dumping it into another silo. No, absolutely. And and I think data lakes for sort of simple uniform data sets seem like a good idea. But once you start putting more complex data sets into them, it quickly became apparent to people that it wasn't very usable. So all your data was there, but nobody, you know, on the business side really understood how to get the data out in a usable way. Um, and that sort of takes you to the second point is, you know, we, we do want to simplify the architectures. Things have gotten very complicated and it really it's all about increasing usability of the data. And that's, that's increasing usability of the actual data. So let's get more use out of it. But it also means make it more accessible to people across the organization. Business, more and more business users, they don't want to have to go through central IT in order right. to even start using the data. You know, they just want to, they want to be able to discover data themselves and explore it and test it. 
Um, and that's all around, you know, usability and, and data fabric, you know, does address all of these issues, which is why, um, as my research and my research does have some use cases from different banks and, and how they're using it in specifics. So if you can check the paper out, there's lots more detail there. But again, you know, just in terms of, um, reduction of costs, you're looking two to four percent. And when you're thinking about how much is being spent, these figures become significant very quickly. So even small percentage increases from from the consistency and automation of data management result in, in big savings. And then you've got all the additional benefits we're talking about, which is putting your, your business into a better position to compete because it's more agile, agile and more flexible. And you can reduce time to market. 100%. Yeah, and I and I would even think about adding. So we see um, all of these as the top drivers on the on the technology side, and the enterprise architecture side. And I would add, you know, number four, making sure um, that you're incorporating, uh, you know, real time data and lowering total cost of ownership as part of that. So so easy to do, right? <laughs> do all these things and lower total cost of ownership, and make sure that you have uh, access to real-time data and enable business user self-service. Uh, that, by the way, that was um, a little bit of sarcasm when I said uh, really easy to do. So what I want you to do <laughs> is just share, a sometimes it takes a while for people to understand my sense of humor, so, so I have to throw that in. Um, so what I wanted to do, uh, just very quickly, um, just talk about the, um, enterprise data fabric and not talk about products or technology, but talk about an architectural approach, because that's really what this is. And we've all seen these slides, right? I mean, this was the canonical data management architecture in you know the year 2000, where you took the data from the different applications and you staged it in a staging data warehouse. You took the real-time data, put it in an operational data store, had an operational data mart, and then you, uh, you know, you built the queries and uh, the aggregations and so forth, and you have an enterprise data warehouse, and then you have different data marts. And so, you know, that that was the nirvana, that was the goal. Sometimes you're able to do it, sometimes not. Um, and there's latency involved, and then depending on what data you wanted, you had to go to a different data mart, and you weren't always uh, guaranteed that you would get the same answers depending on uh, which, uh, uh, silo or which data mart you went to. Um, and then, you know, it didn't always look like that, but quite often it looked like this, where you were populating different uh, data marts directly from different systems. And so then you really had this issue of, you know, I don't know whether or not I can trust the answers because it depends what data mart I go to. So I have different uh, different data and different, uh, different data marts and, and so forth. So this new approach, and again, it's an architectural approach. It's not a product, you can't go buy one. And it's a better way to connect sources with consumers, whether those consumers are business users, uh, or whether they're applications uh, for, you know, internal run the bank or external, you know, innovative, uh, uh, change the bank initiatives. And it's an on demand uh, way to access data from the sources where the data lies without creating another data silo, right? But there's a lot involved in terms of data governance and different connectivity methods and integrating and transforming the data so that it's consistent um, and having a consistent semantic layer, metadata layer, being able to visualize the data, being able to run analytics on the data on demand as business users pull the data uh, or, uh, you know, as applications need to be fed on demand. Uh, and it, it's, you know, most of the enterprise or all of the enterprise architects that we talk to now across, uh, you know, all financial services organizations uh, are, you know, in the process of uh, implementing a, a pattern that looks, uh, that looks like this. And the more that you can incorporate analytics into your data fabric, so that you're not moving the data to a different environment and you don't have to then move it back from Jupyter Notebooks to operationalize the data. Uh, you know, the, the uh, more efficient and the lower latency uh, you're gonna be able to accomplish. Um, and so it's not only feeding business users, but feeding all sorts of innovative applications. 
So I just wanted to share with you one uh, quick use case that we're doing for one of our customers. So the problem that they had, they were a, uh, they're a big commercial bank and they have grown through M&A and they have lots of legacy uh, assets. And so for business management reporting, uh, they had a whole bunch of manual processes and spreadsheets where they were pulling to get together data from different legacy systems. And the reports were on average 10 to 14 days old. And so they wanted to make that one live on demand and, all, and two, provide the business users with the ability to introspect the data. One of the problems that they had is if the user looked at the report and had questions, it would go back to IT and it would take another week or so to answer that. So it was really inefficient. Um, and so um, this enterprise data fabric connects to data sources across the organization, integrates the data, uh, is able to bring in data in any format, uh, real-time data as well as batch data, creates a common semantic layer with security and built-in analytics and the ability for business users to explore the data. And then business users and data stewards now have this uh, ability to go and combine the data and ask questions of the data. So it's not static and it provides the ability uh, to go in and do data exploration and ask new questions of the data and you always get answers that lead to new questions and so forth um, with a common set of APIs that feed business users and applications across the organization. Um, so just really quickly, it was a quick uh, uh, real life implementation of an enterprise data factor for business management reporting. Okay, so uh, before we take questions, Monica, did you have any uh, last comments that you wanted to make and we can open it up to questions? Happy to open up to questions. Okay, so Mike, if we could answer a couple of quick questions here before we run out of time. Sure, absolutely. We're actually just a little bit past the top of the hour here, so let's just uh, let's let's try to get one in here. As I, I had a I had a, a, a feeling that we had so much great content to get through that we were gonna we were gonna pinch our Q and A at the end. But um, let's ask one question, and then just to remind everybody, if you've asked a question we didn't get to, we will definitely be following up. So uh, please, uh, you know, you'll be hearing from us. But let me ask you this: uh, What are you seeing, if anything, around open banking initiatives? Uh, Monica, I, I, I can jump in and take that. So we have a, we have a couple of organizations that are doing that, that right now. And, uh, it, you know, it's very much around uh, agility and, and APIs. And so, you know, firms have the ability to uh, participate both by uh, contributing services and APIs to the open banking ecosystem and to, you know, find ways to increase efficiencies by, by incorporating services and APIs from open banking so that it gives them the opportunity just to focus on more of the areas that are their core competency. And so some of the more commoditized areas, they don't have to build or, or maintain. And so you know, earlier in the talk, we had talked about uh, the agility in terms of being able to use microservices and full lifecycle API management, which is not just about uh, orchestrating and consuming APIs, but also full life cycle means I can uh, create public APIs and monetize them and throttle them and securitize them uh, and so forth. So it's both publishing to contribute to the open API uh, e ecosystem and the open banking ecosystem and consuming. And so publishing you know, creates revenue opportunities and so forth and consuming uh, creates opportunities for increased operational efficiencies and really being able to focus on the things that allow you to differentiate. So in hopefully a minute or less, or that's, that's sort of what we see. The, the other thing that I wanted to say, I don't know if we have time for more questions or not, if Monica had anything to say there, but before we run out of time, I would encourage everybody to go either, either or both to the Sellant website where they can download Monica's latest report, or we have it on our website as well at intersystems.com slash Sellant. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. And I think that is a, a perfect uh, note to wrap up on. Uh, I want to thank both Monica and Joe uh, for a great hour of discussion here. And just one more time, if we didn't get a question, if we didn't get to a question you asked, we will definitely be following up. And uh, you'll also be getting a follow-up email from us that will have a link to the recording of this event as well. So that all will be coming your way. 
And um, with that, I will officially wrap it up. Wish everyone a wonderful rest of the day. And I hope you'll join us again here very soon. Thanks so much. Thank you.